Hello, everyone. Welcome to our mock live class today. Very excited to see all of your faces here tonight. My name is Kate Deering. I am a coordinator for recruitment and admissions here at Geese Online, and I look forward to spending the next hour or so with you. Our time today will be spent providing you with an opportunity to understand how live lectures are delivered and for you to have a chance to interact in this setting. We offer three online master's degree programs, the IMBA, the IMSA, and the IMSM program, as well as five graduate certificates in strategic leadership and management, accounting data analytics, digital marketing, and two recently launched uh, new ones, CPA Pathways and Accounting Foundations. GEESE graduate level programs are innovative, they're affordable, and they're designed to be specifically online to offer a real flexibility and access for full-time working professionals. Today, uh, we're excited that you'll get to experience a webinar from one of our talented faculty members and be able to get a glimpse into what kind of content is shared within GEESE. Our courses uh, balance foundational material shared on the Coursera platform with an interactive high engagement component as well. The high engagement component includes a 90 minute live class each week and many other facets to learning like group projects, there's faculty office hours, networking, and also just being part of a, a large university like Illinois. Since we don't have time today to chat too much about the programs, I am going to share this QR code that's on this first screen. Um, if you'd like to speak with myself or an admissions counselor to discuss your goals or whether or not this program is right for you, I'd love to connect. Um, before we get started learning about financial literacy and what financial statements uh, tell us about firms, I do want to cover a few housekeeping items. I see some of you have your cameras turned on, uh, which is amazing. We're excited to see all of your wonderful faces here today and to be able to interact like you would in a real live uh, weekly class. Please note that you are all muted in order to minimize background noise during this class. There may be moments when Professor Akhtai will invite you to participate and our technical team will unmute your microphone for you. If you have questions, please use the raise hand feature and we will call on you. We will have a breakout session during our time today, which will allow you to participate with your fellow session attendees. After this introduction, look for a quick link in the chat to access some documents and instructions that you are gonna need during your breakout session today. Lastly, we want you to feel comfortable participating in the chat. Feel free to interact with Professor Akhtai and other attendees, and I will also be here to answer any questions that you have about the program. I'm super excited for our live class today. Um, in this mock live class, Professor Akhtai Erkan will explore main financial statements like balance sheets, income and cash flow statements, and how these statements are linked, types of information these statements provide, and what they tell us about firm strategies. I'm, I'm very excited to have Professor Akhtai Erkan, who is a professor of accountancy and a Fred and Virginia Rogers faculty fellow in accountancy. He joined the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2014 after being an assistant professor for seven years at the London Business School. He has made the list of teachers ranked as excellent at the University of Illinois several times and received the Raymond A. Hoffman Faculty Excellence Award in accountancy in 2016. He received his bachelor's in management from Bogazici University in 2002 and his PhD in accounting from the University of Texas at Dallas in 2007. Professor Erkan has 15 years of experience teaching MBA studies and corporate clients, and he currently is teaching a MOOC-based course on financial literacy for thousands of learners around the world using the Coursera platform. He currently teaches ACCI 500, 506, and 532 in the IMSA program at Geese. Please join me in welcoming Professor Akte Arkan. Thank you very much, Kate. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings. This is Accounting 500 mock live session here at University of Illinois. My name is Oktay Arkan. I will have the great pleasure to be your instructor over the next one hour. Here is the plan of attack today. First, I'm going to define you what is financial literacy. Second, I'm going to talk about what is financial accounting information. In particular, our focus will be on balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement. And then we are going to have time for a case study where we will basically put you in breakout sessions. You will discuss a case study that we will share with you for about 15 minutes among yourselves and then all together. If you have any questions, 
please yeah, raise your hand. I will do my best to call your name from time to time. If you have any questions, also chat, put into chat. I am not guaranteed that I will be able to answer all your questions because my attention will be on the secret, but I will do my best. If you're ready, let's get started. All right, what is accounting, okay? I start my online MBA financial accounting class by this definition. What accounting is the measurement, processing, and communication of financial information about economic entities. In plain English, what's going on here is that there are companies out there. They are doing a lot of activities throughout the year as outsiders, for example, as investors. We don't know what they are doing, okay? Just think about Amazon. Do you know each and everything Amazon is doing over a year? No. If you buy a couple of goods, they deliver, then you know. If you don't deliver or they mistakenly deliver, you also know and care. But other than that, you have no idea what Amazon is doing. So, in order to understand what these family companies are doing throughout the year, we need accounting information. Who are the users of accounting information? Actually, there are many parties. Let me just define two of them here. The first one is you and I. When you buy the shares of a company, when you buy a stock of a company, you become a shareholder, you become an investor. And what is your target when you buy a share? Well, you want to buy, for example, a stock from $10, hopefully the stock price will appreciate and you want to sell it from $15. So you want the stock price to go up. What is the most important reason why stock price go up? The most important, there are many other reasons. Well, the company is very profitable. It creates another, a lot of cash flows. And you learn whether a company is creating cash flows, whether it's creating money by looking at financial statements. Another group of party who needs financial accounting information are creditors. Think about banks. What do banks do? They lend money to companies. And what do they care? They want this um, uh, lend, uh, lending money back plus some interest. And therefore, how are they going to ascertain that a company will be able to pay back this money? Well, they are going to look at finance statements. They can understand the company's liquidity position, whether the company generates enough cash flows, whether the company is risky, whether the company is profitable. And all of this information will come from financial accounting. Okay? So what exactly are we talking about? What is the financial accounting information? By financial accounting information, we are talking about the financial statements given in companies' annual reports. Every publicly traded company in the United States and around the world issues a report at the end of their years. And this report is called annual report. In this report, they summarize uh, the actions over the last year. Okay? For example, today my focus will be on annual report prepared by Walmart in year 2022. You can find this online. Just Google, for example, by yourself, right? Google, any report, 2022. You are going to have a PDF document where first page is like this. Please try. Walmart, any report, 2022. You should have a PDF document just like this one. Let me give you 30 seconds. And if you find you, you are well welcome to share the link with your, uh, with your friends through Zoom chat. Walmart, any report, 2022. Can everybody Google? Let's see what financial accounting information is. All right. So Lucas is the first one. It is the same link that I have here. Just go there and please download year 2022 any report of Walmart where we are going to see over the year 2022 what has Walmart done? Did they make money? Are they profitable? Do they have a lot of liabilities? Etc. Let me give you 10 more seconds. Okay? And if you open this document, it's about 200 pages in general. Most of the annual reports are like that. The financial accounting information that we care are at the following pages. The main financial statements, the main financial accounting information are four groups. Balance sheet, which is on page 55. Income statement, which is on page 53. Cash flow statement, page 57. And then there are notes to these financial statements. They are between pages 58 and 79. Today, I'm going to define what these finance statements look like, what kind of information we get out of them, and then how, what, what do we basically conclude about the financial performance of a Walmart over the last year. Okay? Let's do that. Let's start with balance sheet. If you can understand from the na name, balance sheet needs to be balanced, and it shows financial position of a firm at a particular point in time. In balance sheet, we have three groups of items in general. These are... Assets, liabilities, and shareholders' equity. The name of the balance sheet comes from the fact that assets are equal to liabilities plus shareholders' equity. Another way of interpreting this equation is that assets, which are resources that a company has to create value, is equal to how these resources are financed. 
resourcer finance the money to buy these resources that are coming from other liabilities, such as a bank loan or shareholders' equity, which is the investment of shareholders, which are the owners of the firm. Let's just go a little bit deeper. Here is the balance sheet, asset side of a balance sheet, asset side of a um, Walmart. In year 2002, if you look at the last line here, the amount of assets that Walmart has is how much? 244, 860, and all of these numbers are in millions, suggesting that the amount of assets that Walmart has in year 2022 is about 244 billion dollars. Okay, these are all of the resources of Walmart to create value. All right, where is this? How is this resource are financed? They are financed either by liabilities or shareholders' equity. And if you look at their summation, it is exactly the same number. It is about 244 billion dollars. This is where balance sheet names comes from. Assets, resources are equal to liabilities plus shareholders, equity. All right, let's just go a little bit deeper. What exactly is an asset? I said it's a resource controlled by a form to create value. Some of the examples of important assets are buildings, equipment, cash, inventory. Inventory means, in case you don't know, inventory means what the companies are selling. In the context of Walmart, all the grocery items are inventories. Okay? When you look at this asset side of a balance sheet, that's what you see. This is what companies are using to create value for the shareholders. Okay? All right, let me give, now ask you a question. This is your opportunity. Is there a very important resource the companies use to create value, but I will not see on a financial statement? What do you think? Just think about a very important resource that almost every company has, but when you look at a balance sheet, arguably you will never see it. What do you think? Employees, humans, okay, man, you are pretty good. Absolutely, right? Human resource. If you really think about it, especially for technical companies, you know, the most important item, the most important resource to create value is human resource, right? But when you see a balance sheet, you will never ever see it. What's the main reason? The problem is that it's very difficult to attribute a value to human resource. What is the value of a particular employee to Google? It's not obvious. Therefore, we don't include it, okay? Point I'm trying to make here is that yes, assets in a balance sheet is pretty good to summarize all the um, uh, resources of a firm to create value, but not each and every resource is on the balance sheet. That's the idea, okay? All right, there are mainly two groups of assets, two groups of resources. One of them is long-term assets. These are resources with a relatively long life, such as a building, such as an equipment. You are gonna, in general, long and short means we are looking at one year. If you use an asset for more than one year, it's a long-term asset. Current assets, these are assets which is a short life. It generates less than one year, such as cash. You can spend the cash immediately. Inventories, as a Walmart, if you buy milk, you need to sell it within a week, okay? Otherwise, it's gonna get old. And one thing which is, uh, there is a jargon here that I'm gonna discuss later more, account receivable. Just look at the name. I mean, it's not really rocket science. It's a receivable, we gotta receive some money from customers that we already provided service for. Something like this, as a Walmart, I'm gonna sell you a good, you tell me that you're gonna pay me later. Okay, this promise is accounts, accounts receivable. Okay, it's an asset, it's a resource that I'm gonna basically collect money from this resource in the future. Cool? All right, here's the time of an exercise. You already downloaded the balance sheet income statement, cash flow statement of Walmart, right? Here's my first question to you. Please identify the values of the following accounts on Walmart's 2022 balance sheet. I want you to please find the amounts of cash. This is really money. Inventories, here I'm talking about the grocery items, and property and equipment net. Let me give you 30 seconds. Please go to balance sheet, which is on page, I think, 55. This is 55, let's just confirm. Go to balance sheet, please, and find the values of these three items, cash, inventories, property and equipment. Please identify the value of these three items. I already see some numbers you are putting up there. That's great, that's great. All right, do you wanna see it in a real balance sheet? We are gonna basically find the values of these three items. Anthony, can you please zoom in? The first item that I am interested in is cash. How much is it? It's about $14.7 billion. That's a lot, but this is Walmart, right? 
They are generating a lot of cash flow. Just think about all the customers that you see in a Walmart. All right, the second item I am interested in is inventories. Here we are talking about that grocery item, the milk that is, uh, I don't know, the Coca-Cola that you're buying. How much it is? $56 billion. Wow. Basically, at the end of year 2022, if I look at all the inventories that Walmart has, if I look at that, that number is worth $56 billion at one point in time. They have this much of goods ready to sell. And the third item that I was asking is what? Property and equipment net, how much it is? $94 billion. Now, to put these numbers into context, what is the total amount of assets? $244 billion. Out of $244, 94 is property and equipment. Does it make sense? What do you think? You can raise your hand. Does it make sense that Walmart has a lot of property and equipment? Yes, the buildings, absolutely, right? If you really think about Walmarts, most of their business is in terms of all these mega stores that you go. Even in Champaign, we are in the middle of nowhere. There are at least two, three Walmart stores here, okay, and big ones. So all of their value, uh, all of their value is about $94 billion. And does it make sense? I would say so, okay? In the context of Walmart, it's very logical that uh, the biggest assets, the biggest resource they have is their stores. The second one is, in terms of the numbers, we are just looking at the size of these numbers, inventories, about $56 billion. Does it make sense that Walmart has a lot of inventories? What do you think? Does it make sense that Walmart has a lot of inventories? Sure. They're just selling these items to create value for shareholders, right? If you go to Walmart, they're all stacked. So what did we learn from the asset side of a balance sheet? Okay, this is basically, I would call a boring company in the sense that they are a traditional company. The most important assets they have is their stores and their inventories. Okay, this is what we learn from by looking at the asset side of a balance sheet. This is what they use mainly to create value. Why do we care about this information? Basically, if something happens to inventories or the property and equipment of Walmart, they might be in trouble because this is the main assets that they are using to create value. Now, I'm going to look at how these assets that you have seen at finance, where is the money coming from to buy these assets? That's the question. The first group of money that can come from is liabilities. Formally, liabilities means these are obligations. And for example, a bank loan, accounts payable. Accounts payable is the opposite of account receivable that I discussed in the asset side. Accounts payable means I buy some goods from my suppliers, okay? And then I pay them sometime later, okay? Accounts receivable, I sell goods, I'm gonna collect later. Accounts payable is, I buy goods from my suppliers, I'm going to pay sometime later. All right. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there any examples of obligations not recognized as liabilities? Is there anything we might owe, but I'm not going to put in the balance sheet? This is a tough question. Renting out land, utility bills, utility bills, you know, this is tough. This is a little tough, Okay. Most of the things that you, okay, insurance policies, Louis, you are close, okay? So generally orders, just think about big airlines like Emirates, right? They, whenever they buy an airline, they, they, whenever they buy aircraft, they give an order. Okay, I basically order 150 Boeing 777 for airplanes. When they give an order like this, if they don't make any payment, that thing, that order, or since there is a contract signed, they need to pay that money. But that's not accounting until they start paying money. But this is a little bit detail, okay? Most of the time, in accounting, whenever we have a liability, we recognize it, okay? And if you want to see the liabilities of Walmart, again, we have two, three categories here, not two. Current liabilities is similar to current assets. These are liabilities that I need to pay in a year, such as accounts payable. This is the money that I owe to my suppliers. Wage payable. This is the money that I owe to my employees. Second group of liabilities are long-term liabilities. This is something that I'm going to pay in more than one year, such as it's a 15-year bank loan. And the third group of liabilities is a little interesting, provisions. Here, in accounting, we are very conservative. When we forecast that something bad happened in the future, I am going to create a liability for this, such as somebody is, let's say, suing me for an environmental hazard, and there is a good chance that I'm going to lose this lawsuit. In the scenario, I create a liability for potential lawsuit settlement money in the future, okay? But provision is a little bit more detailed. Our focus will be on current liabilities and long-term liabilities. Now, here's an exercise for you. 
Now we are going to look at liability size, liability size of a balance sheet for Walmart in year 2022, and we are going to identify three numbers. Accounts payable, long-term debt due within one year, long-term debt. Can you please identify these numbers? Please again look at the balance sheet. Now look at on liability side. We are basically looking at the amount of money that they are supposed to pay in the future, and we identify three things. Accounts payable. Long-term debt, do you one year? And long-term debt, can you please find that? I see some of these numbers are coming fine. Accounts payable is 55,000 something, okay. What about the second item here? Accounts payable, 55. Yep, 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 you are, you are already bringing numbers. Let's just discuss them. The first number that I am asking you is accounts payable. This is the money that I owe to my suppliers. How much it is? 55 billion. Uh, by the way, just put in the context, the total amount of liable, this is about 85, uh, 100, it's about 150 billion dollars. That's the total amount of liabilities. Out of 150, 55 is coming from accounts payable. Huh. This is the money that as Walmart, I owe to my suppliers. What does this mean? Suppose that I have a milk supplier, the guy delivers the milk today, okay? I sell it in my store and I better just tell him that, you know, I'm going to pay you sometime later. That's what I'm talking about. Accounts payable, the money that I owe to my supplier, 55. How about the other items? Long-term debt due within one year. When you borrow money, you let's say you're going to pay over the next one or 10 years. Every year, some of basically this borrowing becomes current, become payable within a year. That's what we are talking about. Here is long-term debt, but I'm going to pay it. The, the chunk of the long-term pay debt that I'm going to pay this year, it's about $2.8 billion. That's not really wow. And finally, long-term debt, it is about $34 billion. Now, let's put these numbers into context. It looks like that we have about $150 billion worth of liabilities. Out of which, which is the most important number? Which one? What's the largest number here? Hmm? You already know. Absolutely. Accounts payable. What is special about accounts payable is as follows. When I owe money to my suppliers, there is no interest in that money. Okay? Basically, think about the case like this. Let's say you are a milk supplier. You are selling the milk to me. You deliver today. I'm telling you that I will pay your milk two months later. In the meantime, I sell the bill. I sell them sort of milk and I use your money for two months. Are you with me? Because this is milk, right? I cannot hold on to this. So what I'm trying to say here is that it is true that Walmart has a good chunk of liabilities, but most of these liabilities are interest-free. They are using the money of the suppliers interest-free. If you really think about it, this is a very cheap, if anything, free source of financing. I'm using suppliers' money to finance my operations, okay? I'm not sure you are familiar with, there were a lot of articles in the, in the uh, magazines, they're just saying that Walmart is abusing their suppliers. They just, for example, in the case of milk, they buy the milk today, sell it tomorrow, but they're gonna use the money they owe to milk supplier like um, two months later, okay? But the problem is that as a milk supplier, what can you do? You're not gonna sell to mil uh, milk to Walmart? Are you happy to lose such a customer? I don't think so. All I'm trying to say here is that this is going to be turning up pretty important. The most important source of financing in terms of liabilities for Walmart is suppliers' money, which is free. Free. I buy the milk today, sell it tomorrow, I'm going to pay you two months later. Within these two months, I'm going to use your money. Worst case scenario, I'm going to put your money into a bank account, earn interest. That's the worst case scenario. Remember, Walmart had a lot of cash. This is where the cash is coming from. Okay? I buy the milk today. Sell it tomorrow, I generate cash, I hold on to this cash for two months, I'm going to pay you two months later. And honestly, as a supplier, you cannot do much. You don't want to sell to me? Sure, I'm going to buy the milk from somebody else, okay? That is, uh, that is and this is going to turn out to be quite important soon. Most important liability of Walmart is free. Okay? Now, I'm going to basically go to the third section of a balance sheet, which is shareholders' equity. Just don't look at the jargon. Basically, shareholders' equity means this is the investment of companies' owners, shareholders. 
when you buy when you buy one shares of uh, Walmart, you became a shareholder. You become an owner of this company. Your money that you're basically spending becomes like the balance sheet of Walmart. Okay. In terms of algebra, we know that balance sheet needs to balance. Assets are equal to liabilities plus shareholders' equity. Basically, shareholders' equity is in terms of algebra. Assets minus liabilities. Okay, what exactly is included here? What are the shareholders' equity items? There are many items here. I'm going to focus on three of them. The first one is common stock. I am guessing most of you are shareholders of a company. Did you ever see a share, actual share certificate in your hand? Have you ever seen it? Yes. Okay, Zoom users say yes. Most of you should say no. Okay, I have never seen it. If you really see a share certificate, a real one, a real one, on it, there is a very symbolic price. There is a paper price. Okay, they say that this is one share of Walmart. The price of one share is very symbolically is a small number, such as five cents, 10 cents. Okay, this paper value is called common stock. Okay, paper value of a share when you buy a Walmart share is called common stock. That's what I mean by nominal or par value of a share. It's very small. Five cents, 10 cents, 25 cents, okay? Something like this. On the other hand, if you buy a Walmart share today, can you please check how much is a share price, how much is share price of Walmart today? Do you mind just Googling it? Can you buy a share of Walmart for 25 cents? Do you mind just checking, checking it? Huh. Dustin is telling me that it's a little over $140. So you will never ever buy a share of Walmart from 25 cents, okay? The money that you pay over and above the paper value is additional paid in capital, okay? You will never ever buy a share of Walmart from the paper value of whatever the church certificate says. You are gonna pay over and above that. In the case of Walmart, paper value is 10 cents. You are buying a share for $143. That difference is additional paid in capital. I pay this additional over and above paper value to become a shareholder of Walmart. And finally, the third component of any shareholder's um, equity is something very interesting. Let's just read the name super carefully. Retained earnings. In plain English, what does this mean? These are earnings, these are income, retained in the business. So what does this mean? Conceptually, companies like Walmart is owned by shareholders. When Walmart makes money, makes an income, they're supposed to distribute this money, this income to shareholders, okay? So I'm Walmart, I work for a year, I make some income, at the end of the year, I need to distribute it to you as Walmart shareholders. But most of the time, shareholders say that, okay, whatever the money that you have made, you don't have to distribute all of them to me or none of them to me. You just keep in the business as a form of further investment and use this money in expanding the operations. Okay, that income earned by the firm for shareholders but not distributed to shareholders is called retained earnings. These are earnings, this is income, this is money made by the firm, but shareholders say, don't pay it to me yet, pay sometime later, okay? And that's called retained earnings. So, let's do another exercise. Now we are gonna look at shareholders equity section of Walmart in year 2022, and we are gonna identify these three numbers. Common stock, this is the total pay paper value, capital in excess of par value, which is additional paid in capital, and retain earnings. Can you please identify these numbers? Okay, I, I already see some of those numbers. If you look at here, the amount of common stock is 276 million. It's kind of small. This is the total value, total paper value. But as I said, when you buy shares of Walmart, you are gonna pay over and above this. How much is over and above? Which is capital in excess of par value, which is additional paid in capital. They are the same thing. It's about $4.8 billion. Okay, and three, it looks like that the, the largest number in the section is retain earnings. What did we say about this? This is earnings, income made by um, Walmart for shareholders, but not distributed to shareholders yet, but it is invested in the business. How much it is? It's about $86 billion. 
All right, we said the shareholders' equities. Anthony, can you please show me? Now, let me ju let's just summarize what we learned from the balance sheet of Walmart. In the balance sheet, in the asset side, we looked at uh, um, resources of the Walmart, and we have seen there are two main resources to create value. What are those? Stores, inventories. In the liabilities and shareholders' equity side, we just see how the stores and inventories are financed. In the liabilities, we have seen that the most important liability is accounts payable, which is the money that we owe to suppliers, and it is free. In the shareholders' equity side, we see another form of financing now by shareholders. What is that? Retained earnings. The interesting thing about a retained earnings is that it is free as well. This is the money of shareholders, but shareholders say, don't give it to me. Just keep it in the business. So if we summarize it, okay, Walmart is creating value by using inventory and, and property and equipment, and these assets are financed freely. This company, Walmart, is not paying a lot of interest to finance these operations. Money is either coming from accounts payable, which is the supplier's money, or retained earnings, which is the money earned by the share uh, earned for the shareholders, but not distributed shareholders yet. Okay. So, in other words, by looking at this asset side of a balance sheet, we just see that Walmart is running a very tight ship. They finance their operations freely. Okay which is going to be super important when we are discussing your case study, where in Netflix, we are going to discuss where the money is coming from. In this case, it's all free. Cool? This is what we learned from the balance sheet. The second important finance statement that we can analyze is income statement. As you can understand from the name, in the income statement, we see a company's financial performance over a period, generally it's a year. Here we see all revenues. Revenues are gains, sales and all the expenses over a period. In particular, when you look at an income statement, you're gonna see sales, which equivalently can be called as revenues and turnover, they are the same thing. Cost of sales, in the case of cost of sales, if let's say Walmart is buying a gallon of milk for $4, selling it for five, that $4, the purchase price of the milk from a supplier is cost of the sales. I am making a sales, but how much the sales cost me? In my example, that's $4. Operating expenses, by operating expenses in the context of Walmart, here we are talking about utility expense, electricity, water, wages, insurance, distribution, etc. Other income, remember Walmart has a lot of cash. Where do you think they keep the cash? In a bank account. The interest that they are earning from the supplier's money is other income of Walmart. Income tax, tax is holy. Everybody has tax. You pay tax, I pay tax, Walmart also pay tax, okay? That's an important group of expense. And finally, you don't see this much. That's why the name is extraordinary. There are some extraordinary gains and losses. You don't see this much. For example, if there's a fire in a Walmart superstore, the loss from that fire is called a loss, but it's extraordinary because we don't have a fire every day. Thank God, okay? Now, let's do another exercise. We are now going to focus on income statement of Walmart, and we are going to answer three questions. And we are going to find three items in this 2022 income statement. These are revenues, cost of sales, operating income. Can you please find these numbers? Let's see how profitable is Walmart. Are they making money? Can you find these three numbers? I think income statement on page 53. Are they making money? Total revenues. This is all of the sales. Cost of sales. This is the cost of all of these uh, inventories, all of the money that we owe to suppliers. And operating income, which means income from our operations. Can you please find these numbers? Total revenues. Cost of sales. Operating income. Did you find? Did everybody find it? 30 more seconds. Okay, Anis is saying revenues is something. Let's just follow it. What is the total amount of sales, total amount of revenues? $572 billion. This is all of their sales in all of their superstores in year 2022. That's huge. That's huge. $572 billion. But this is just sales. Is there a cost of sale? In the case of milk, okay, this is $5 sales price. But how much the milk cost? That is cost of sales. How much it is? 
429 billion dollars. That's also a huge amount. And after that, what is their operating income? It's about 25 billion dollars. Operating income means technically it is income from my operations. But I, I would like to basically go a little bit further. What is the net income of Walmart? If you see the number at the end of here, consolidated income attributed to Walmart, don't worry about the uh, name. Here, the income, net income of Walmart at the end of year 2022, which is the last number here in year 2022 column. How much it is? About $13 billion. Basically, Walmart in year 2022 makes total sales of $572 billion, out of which they pay everybody. They pay everybody. They pay cost of sales to suppliers. They pay electricity, water, interest, tax, blah, 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 everything is paid. How much is left? $13.6 billion. Can you calculate the profit margin of Walmart? How much it is? Let's put a pen here. How much is the profit margin of Walmart? Let's see whether they are really a profitable company. So you're going to take their income, 13,673. You're going to divide this by their total revenues, 572,754. Can somebody please calculate this for me? How much is the pro profit margin of Walmart? 2.38. So let me just write this. So what does it tell you? When you go to Walmart next time, when you spend $100 and you say, man, this was so expensive, don't think that it was really expensive. Out of $100 that you spend in Walmart, the net after Walmart pays to everybody is net to Walmart, how much? $2.4 net. They are not making too much money per $100. But how do they make money? They have high turnover. High turnover means this is a company, it's making a lot of sales. Okay, and that's how they generate their revenue and their net income. So this is a low margin business, 2.4. For every $100 that you spend, Walmart is making $2.4 from you. They have high volume sales. This is now what we learned from the income statement of Walmart. They have a lot of sales. They have a good amount of profit to about 13 billion. But the point I'm trying to make here is that if you look at the margin, it's about 2.4%. Whatever they sell, 2.4 is in their pocket. Okay. Now I want you to please keep this number in your mind. In year 2022, Walmart made an income of 13 point, how much? $6 billion. Cool. This is a low margin business. That's why I said it's one of those, if anything, it's a boring company. Now I'm going to come back and tie this to balance sheet. Remember, Walmart is financing their operations through free money. Free money is coming from either suppliers or from shareholders. Do you know now why that free money is very important? If Walmart pays a lot of interest to a bank to finance their operations, this margin will be smaller and smaller and smaller. Therefore, whenever there is an innovation, for example, let's increase the minimum wage to Walmart. One of the companies which fight very hard against those type of things is Walmart. Their margin is small anyway, 2.38%. If you increase the minimum wage, for example, if you increase their, I don't know, insurance contribution, if you say that Walmart from now on finance their operations from a bank, this will be smaller and smaller, okay? Therefore, this type of low margin companies fight very hard to anything which will increase their expenses. They are already running a tight ship here. Cool? Let's keep this in mind. The third finance statement that I'm gonna briefly talk about, but I'm not gonna very much into this is a cash flow statement. The thing here is that uh, not every sales that we are making is cash, okay? Sometimes I'm going to sell you a truck, but I tell you just pay me sometime next year. Is it the revenue? Sure, but there is no cash. To see what, whether the company is generating actually the hardcore cash that we can talk about this, there is a cash flow statement, which is the third important finance statement. Cash flow statement has three parts, operating, investing, and financing. The most important part of a cash flow statement is operating cash flows. From my core operations, in the context of Walmart, here we are talking about buying and selling groceries. From my core operations, do they generate cash? 
because you can get the cash from a bank. I'm not interested in that one. I am interested in your operating cash flow from your core operations, buying and selling grocery. Do you generate cash? If you look at the cash flow statement of Walmart in year 2002, the first section is cash flow from operating activities. I'm not going to go much into detail. I just want to attract your attention to the last number here. How much it is? About $24 billion. What it says here is that Walmart in year 2022 generated a cash from their operations of about $24 billion. That's a good number. You are going to generally compare this number to income. Income was about $13.6 billion. And the amount of cash generation is 24. These numbers are more or less close to each other. That's what we want. Whenever the red flag happens, when the company has a lot of income, but no cash flows. Most of the accounting frauds that we happened in early 2000s had this feature. The company is very profitable. They are selling like crazy. But they don't have any cash. Okay? Because they are cooking the books. They seem, they are, seem like they are sh uh, selling uh, items. Okay? They do very innovative stuff. For example, how do I show that I am selling items? Well, I can just say that look at my trucks. I am basically shipping goods to my customer. Instead of shipping goods to my customer, I ship those goods to a warehouse that I rented. Okay? People see, oh, these guys are shipping the goods to a customer and then booking the revenues. That's not true. I'm shipping to a warehouse that I already rented. That's an account of fraud. In early 2000s, if you look at most of the accounting flows, they had this feature. They are very profitable, but they don't generate a lot of cash flows. Okay, therefore, cash flow statement is quite important. We want the number in the cash flow statement from operating cash flows to be very close to net income. Otherwise, there are some red flags. How come you are very profitable, but you don't generate cash? Cool. Any questions for me? Professor, okay, we do have one question in chat from Jay yes. Moss. Are there yes. any publicly traded companies that allow shareholders to charge interest while allowing the company to keep its retained earnings? No. No. That's free money. Okay? You can ask the money to pay to pay to you as dividends. But again, most of them, you and I are small investors. Walmart will not listen to you and I. They can listen big investors, like institutional investors. If there is a hedge fund investing in Walmart, Walmart, uh, Walmart they might listen at the hedge fund. But other than that, you and I, we cannot charge interest. It's free money. If Walmart wants to pay you, they will pay. If they don't want, they don't. Any other question for me? Okay. So let's We've just sum up what we learn about Walmart. Yeah, there is another hand. Sorry, yes, uh, Raj is, has his hand raised. Hey, Professor Khan. Um, why do you say, like, you know, that Walmart is running off free money when they would have a loan from a bank like you know to buy the asset or build a building or do something about it why do you keep on saying uh, that they are running up free money from either account payable or right. Right. <clears throat> so i'm saying that they are using free money okay instead of borrowing a lot of money from a bank they are using the money which is free to them accounts payable if you owe money to suppliers you don't pay them interest i buy your milk today I sell that milk tomorrow, I'm going to pay you two months later. The same money, no interest, nothing additional. If I owe you today 100, I will pay you 100. That's what I mean by free money. If I borrow $100 from a bank, I need to pay them interest. And I'm saying that this free money is very important. Why? Because interest and um, 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 profit margin of Walmart is very small. Okay? This company is running a very tight ship. Interest mar uh, profit margin is very small. For every $100 sales that they are making, they have net 2.4. They don't want to pay this interest, otherwise this margin will be smaller. Does that help? Did I answer your question? It does, thank you. All right, Raj, thank you. Uh, I was initially I thinking... If I buy a Walmart, I'm sorry, did I cut? And Hari is asking me, if I buy Walmart stock, where does that go? Hari, it goes nowhere. Because you are not buying the Walmart stock from Walmart, right? You are buying Walmart stock from, for example, me. It comes to me. Therefore, it goes nowhere. If you buy the stock di directly company from a company, then it's going to go to shareholders' equity. Cool? Hari. Are we good? Uh, yes. I was muted. Yeah, that answered the question. Thank you so much. That's all right. I'm just joking. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you. I see a Thank hand. you. Thank you. 
Is it Michelle? Am I seeing correctly? Yes. Hi. Um, I have hi. a question. I, it might be slightly unrelated, but uh -huh. um, so talking about the stocks, you mentioned that it, it only goes onto the statement if it's bought directly from um, Walmart. Yes. And I do, I think I understand that, like you said, the shares that you, people usually buy are not direct. So like Absolutely. where, where does the transaction of the direct shares happen if it's not on like the platforms that people usually use? Right. The direct ones happen sometimes like this. Okay. From time to time, Walmart can say that, look, we need extra money because let's, I'm just making it up. We are going to have new operations in Africa. I'm just totally making it up. Mm -hmm. They need money. So where is the money going to come from? They can say that, okay, guys, I am going to print shares. Shares means just a certificate, which gives you ownership, and I'm going to sell it to you. Generally, they do this by using some intermediaries, investment banks. I, I'm not sure you're familiar. Have you ever heard of their names? Investment banks help Walmart to sell their shares to the public. Okay? And this, this process is called SEO. SEO. Secondary Equity Offering. I am offering you uh, equity, which is basically shares in the secondary market. But this doesn't happen regularly. Basically, if you go today in your trading account, if you buy a Walmart share, you're not buying it from Walmart. You are buying the shares from people who already have Walmart shares and they want to sell. Okay? This doesn't go to Walmart. But if Walmart is selling these shares, printing new shares and selling to public because they want to raise money to expand their operations in a continent, then it's going to go to shareholders' equity. The answer a question? Thumbs up, thumb down. Okay. Andy is telling me if Walmart prints more shares, does this dilute Isle shares? Yes, sure. Okay. What does dilution mean? Let's say today there are 10 shareholders of Walmart. I'm just making it up. And there are 10 shares of Walmart. If Walmart prints 50, five more shares, now there will be 15 shareholders, 15 shares. Basically, previously, I own one-tenth of a company because there are 10 shares, 10 shareholders. Now, I'm going to own one divided by 15 of a company. Sure. Therefore, as an old shareholder or former shareholder, I generally don't want Walmart to sell these shares in the public. And most of the time, when Walmart wants to sell these shares in the public, Walmart gets the permission of the former shareholders. They ask, guys, I need money. Do you mind if I print shares and sell to people? If they say no, you cannot sell it. Sure because there is dilution, because they lose their voting rights. Okay, and one more question here. Would the SEO be represented in a different bucket than the common stock and capital stock excess of power? No, it's the same thing, okay? Common stock is paper value of the shares that are sold, whether at the time of initial establishment or SEO, uh, same thing with the excess power value. They are all the same, okay? Any other question for me? Did I miss any questions in the chat? Tom, can you please help me, or Kate? I think we're good. Okay. Uh, we just got one more question. Does okay, the paper value bear any significance? No, it's a very stupid number. It's a low term. When you really see a shared certificate, it's really a very, very small random number. One cent, five cent, 10 cents, something. Point is that you will never ever pay that money to buy the shares. You are gonna always pay more than that. And the additional money that you're paying is additional paid in capital, okay? In the case of Walmart, Walmart share is about $143 today, but the paper value is a very small number, probably about 10 cents. The difference is additional paid in capital, okay? All right, one more question. If Walmart is sold today, what is the value of each shareholder? I, I, let me ask you this way, Chandra. What is the value of the Walmart public? Okay, if I think you can ask. You can find total number of shares of Walmart you are going to multiply that number with Walmart share price, $143, which is the money that you need to have to buy Walmart. Okay? You can calculate it by yourself. Just, just search online. The number of shares of Walmart times $143 is going to be how much money you need to have to buy all of the Walmart, which I think is an astronomical number. Okay? What is the significance of the having paper value? There is no significance. It's a low term. Paper value is coming from law. It's a very, very, very old concept. Share certificates needs to have this small number. It's nothing to do with accounting, nothing to do with logic. It's a law term. 
And actually saying that, is it paper value, but actual value is 4839. Akshay, you are right, okay? I'm not sure your calculations are correct, but that's true. Paper value is nothing to do with the value that you can pay to buy all of the shares of Walmart. Okay, what I'm gonna do is that, I wanna do a case study. You have already seen how I analyze the finance statements of Walmart, which I characterize as a boring company. It has boring assets, plant property equipment inventory. They finance these assets free, either by accounts payable or retail earnings. They are profitable, but not crazy. Their profit margin is about 2.4%. And then they are creating positive cash flow from their operations. Now, we're going to look at the finance statements of another company, which I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you're all familiar with, Netflix. We are going to answer case questions. Now, Kate already sent a link to you. You can go to that link. You can see the case questions of Netflix. There are about seven of them. You can also see the uh, any report of Netflix. Please answer the case questions of Netflix by looking at the any report. My friends now will put you in groups of five. You will discuss among each other, and then I will see you in 15 minutes, okay? Let's get going. We are yes. back, Professor. All right. All right. Welcome, everyone. Nice to see you. I hope you had a great discussion. Here are case questions about Netflix. Let's see what Netflix is doing and how it is comparable to Walmart. Question number one is asking you what are the two largest assets? Assets are in the balance sheet. Balance sheet is on page 42. Two largest assets are content assets. Hmm, a name that I never heard of so far, or you didn't. And the second one is familiar, cash. And if you want to see this in the real finance statements, that's what we have. The first item here is cash. And all of these numbers are in terms of thousands. That's what it says in the title. The amount of cash is about $6 billion. Cool. And the content asset it is something we never discussed so far, but we are going to discuss in the next question is about how much? $31 billion. Is this a big number? Yes. If you look at the total amount of assets, it's $44 billion. Out of 44, 31 is content assets. So the most important resource the Netflix uses to create value is this stuff content assets, which we are going to discuss in the next question. Would you expect these to be Netflix's main assets given the nature of its business? I am guessing everybody know what Netflix is sell selling, right? They are just selling the streaming services. Let's start with the cash. Do you expect cash to be a significant asset of Netflix? Sure. Almost every firm that I know of has a significant chunk of cash for bad days. In case something bad happens, they have cash. But what, what is this thing? What is content assets? If you really search for content assets, you can just actually search on the PDF document. It is discussed on pages 44, 49 and 50. And they say that it's about uh, licensed, produced, release, and in production development content. You, know, you see all the movies that you, show, you see on Netflix? This is their value. Okay? And if you want to see this in a final statement on page 49, if you, uh, Anton, if you can really zoom me in, here we see the details of where this um, uh, content is coming from. Out of 30, 31 billion dollars, the most important one is the licensed content. This is the content that Netflix is licensing from other institutions. They have some release content. They have in-production content, which is about nine billion dollars. And then they also have a, um, uh, in development pre-production content. It's about one billion dollars worth. Okay, this is their movies that we are talking about. Does it make sense? in the context of Netflix that their most important asset is movies? Sure. Okay, that's what they do to create value. I'm gonna go to a little bit further. I'm gonna go to page 50 and I, there are some very interesting piece of information that I would like to highlight. I want to do ju just highlight in this page that look, the amount of the value of all the movies of um, Netflix is 30 billion. Out of which, if you go to next page, they are talking about this thing. The following table represents the amortization of content assets. You don't have to know what amortization is in, in just basically very simple term. Amortization means how much of your assets you have, but it's not valuable anymore. Okay, it's losing value. If you look at year 2021, which is this year, what is the amount of content which is not useful anymore to create value? 12 billion. Ah. They have 13 billion of content out of which in one year, 12 billion became useless. Useless means it doesn't create a lot of value. In fact, if you a little bit search a little bit more about this amortization of the content on page 45, 
you have this statement. Can you please read? It has a lot of jargon, but I'm going to summarize for you. They say that on average, 90% of our content is amortized, losing its value in four years. So whatever the content they have, it has a life of four years. After four years, that content is use useless. If you really think about the Netflix content, in the first year, it's very valuable. Everybody watches it. But let's just think about it. Do you remember what did you watch in the Netflix last year? Do you? You don't. I don't. Okay, I watch a lot of content these days. I am in Hulu. I am watching, I will say it's a horror story, Handmaid's Tale. Did you guys watch that? Handmaid's Tale is awesome. It's really heartbreaking. Okay, just think about this. Okay, I am not going to basically spoil it for you. Point is I'm watching it. Did, what did I watch before Handmaid's Tale? Handmaid's Tale? I don't remember. Okay, that's the same thing. Okay, but so I'm going to basically talk about it a little bit more here. The most important that the asset that you have is content but content is losing its value like crazy, okay? In four years, it become useless. Huh. Let's compare to Walmart. What does comp Walmart has in terms of most important assets? Inventory, grocery, and stores. Does stores lose value in four years? No, it's the same store. It's pretty good. Point I'm trying to make here is that the assets that um, Netflix has is very, very risky, okay? They need to have content which is losing its value like crazy to create value. And they need to have content all the time, all the time, all the time, because the content becomes useless in at most four years. And I'm guessing most of the time after one year, content is not very valuable. Let's keep this in mind. They have a lot of content. It's losing value like crazy. Where is the money coming from? Which is the next question. Where is the money to produce this content? In the Walmart, the money is coming from suppliers, milk guys, and shareholders. Let's see who's, where is the money coming from here. What are the two largest liabilities? If you look at the liability section of a balance sheet on page 42, you're going to see the two largest liabilities are long-term debt and current, current, control, uh, current content liabilities. If you want to see this in a balance sheet, that's what you see. The amount of total liabilities, if you look at the last number here in year 2021, is how much? $28 billion, out of which 14 is what? Long-term debt, which is not free. You borrow this money. Walmart's money was always free. Here, we are basically playing with some risky money for which we need to pay it back, plus interest. And the second component of this um, um, important liabilities is current content liabilities. We didn't define it, but I think you can guess this. Current means this is content that I need to pay within a year to my producers, for example. How much it is? About $4 billion, okay? I would like to talk a little bit about these liabilities. Let's talk about long-term liabilities, which is the next question. What type of obligations are represented by these liabilities? Long-term debt is defined in page 53. I'm not sure you had a chance to look. Most of these are bonds. If you look at page 53, that's what you see. Bonds are a form of borrowing, not from a bank, but from public. Okay? Companies can borrow money from the public by issuing bonds. Okay. So if you, for example, take an account of the course that I'm teaching, we, di we di discuss the bonds, their features, how they're going to be paid in a year. But all I, you need to know here is that this is borrowing, not from a bank, but from public, from like you and me or big corporations it can be a lender to Netflix. Okay, this is the most important source of borrowing and it's not free. If you look at the first numbers here, these are interest rates. For example, the first bond has an interest rate of 5.375%. This is not free money. And the second liability is very, very interesting. I'm not sure you had a chance to look at all the notes. If you just search for content liabilities, that's what you have. Can you please read this? I got this thing from page 54 just to understand what are we talking about as a current, control, a current content liability. Can you please read this?
they say that actually for our content, our total liabilities is a weird number, $23.2 billion, out of which 4.3 is current, which means that needs to pay it in the next year. 3.1 is non-current, which is paid in a time period more than one year, but that's the catch here. We also have a content liability. We basically committed to pay how much? $15.8 billion of obligations that we have. You don't even see it. Point I'm trying to make here is that Netflix has a lot of liabilities. Some of them show up on the balance sheet as a long-term debt. Some of them doesn't even show up. Let's summarize what did we learn so far. Netflix's most important asset is content, which is amortized, which is losing its value like crazy. The money to amortize, the money to create that content is borrow money, either from a bonds or we just basically pay to these production studios. And there is a huge amount of commitment that we have, which is 15.8 billion. You don't even see this. Compare the Walmart. They are running a very, very, very risky model. Okay? Walmart, if anything, boring. They have simple assets. The money to finance the simple assets are free. Here, we have a very risky asset, which is content. It has a life of probably maximum four years, but I gotta argue that most of life of that content is one year, if not less. You guys are talking about Squid Game. Okay? Who is watching Squid Game right now? I watched it, yes. But it's done deal. Correct? It's done. Okay, there is a hand. I'm gonna stop here. Michelle, uh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry if I missed this, but if an I if an item is not does not meet the criteria for asset recognition, okay. then where would it be accounted for on the on the financial statement? Nowhere. Just in a note. Remember in the example note. that I gave you. Emirates gave an order for uh, aircrafts. Yeah. That's what it is. I gave an order to produce this, this, this. The guy said, yes, sir, I'm going to produce for you. They are working so, on will the will the obligations be recognized then? No, it will be just Not disclosed on the footnotes, just like what okay. you see here. Yep. Okay. Remember the title. In fact, look at the title here. They just commitments and contingencies. These are our commitments. But okay. I gave them an order to produce. They said, yes, sir. That's all that happened. Therefore, it's in a footnote. It's not in the final statements, but it's coming. As soon as that movie is ready to stream, I will have $15.8 billion more dollars to pay. You can think about this as hidden debt. It's hidden. It's coming, though. Okay. Thank cool. you. All right. All right, now that's what we heard from the balance sheet. Now I'm going to go to income si statement side of this business to see whether they're making money. What is the value of revenues over the year end at December 2021? The income statement is on page 39. If you look at there, the amount of revenues or um, is about $29.7 billion. Let's make it $30 billion, okay? I'm just rounding it. If you look at the income statement, the amount of revenues in year 2021 is about, I'm just rounding it up, about $30 billion. That's pretty good. Not as much as Walmart. You can compare the Walmart. Walmart sales are enormous. Okay. And second question here in terms of income statements. What is the amount of net income? Okay, we know that we have about $30 billion of sales. But what's the income after we pay everybody? We pay all this content. We pay interest. We pay tax. We pay water. What is left? That's the question. And again, it's on the income statement on page 39. What is that number? Actually, it's pretty big. About $5 billion, if you just look at the last line here. What is the profit margin? You are going to divide 5. I'm just rounding these numbers by 30. It's about 16.6%. Huh. That's actually a profitable business. What was the profit margin of Walmart? Do you remember? How much was that? 2.38 peanut. Here, these guys, they are running a very risky business, but honestly, it's pretty good in terms of income, right? 16.6%. They pay a lot of money to content. They paid a lot of money to interest. The money that they are using is not free, okay? And they have a profit margin of 6.6%. It looks very good, isn't it? Okay. 
What was the last question I answered about Walmart? I looked at Walmart's cash generating ability from their operations. You remember that? Okay, this is income. This may not be cash. There is a good chance that they, there is not this much cash because they are spending a lot of money on new content. Let's just see that, which is the next question. What is the value of cash flows from operations over the year ended 2021? Cash flow statement is on page 41. I'm going to go there and I'm going to see that the amount of cash flow statement, which is the, which the amount of cash generated from operations, the last number here, how much? 392 million. What's going on? I have income of about $5 billion, but net generation of cash from from operations, how much? About 300, 400 million. That's peanut. For Walmart, we had more cash generated from operations than income, which I said is pretty good. Here, it's kind of the opposite. We have a lot of income. We seem very profitable, but if I look at the actual money, which is basically my operations are generating, how much? about 300, 400 million dollars. That's why I'm asking here, what's going on? Why we have so low amount of cash from our operations? And if you go here and look at the first red rectangle that I have here, there is a huge negative number in cash flow from operations. What is that? Additions to content assets. So in this year, in year 2021, Netflix has spent 17.7 .7 billion dollars to produce new content. That's why they are profitable, but they don't have much cash. Okay, let's summarize what did we learn about Netflix. In the asset side, we have seen that the most important asset of Netflix is what? Content. And I am saying that content is a very risky asset. According to what Netflix is saying, this content has a life of maximum four years. In my opinion, a content has a life of maximum one year. I'm telling you, we are just forgetting what I bought you uh, six months ago, okay? Where is the money coming from to finance this content? The money to finance the content is coming from liabilities, debt, which is bonds, and we also have a lot of commitments for future content. And all of these things are not interest-free. I need to pay extra money to borrow this money so that content is generated. So I'm running a risky model. If you look at the income statement, we are very profitable. 16.6%, everything looks good. But if you look at the cash generating ability, it's peanut. Why this is such a big deal? If something bad happens to Netflix, they don't have enough cash flows to finance their operations. That's why cash flow from operations is a big deal. In fact, this was year 2021. Can, Anthony, can you show me full screen, please? In fact, this, this is their 2021 uh, income statement, right? What happened in year 2022 to Netflix? Does anybody know? What happened to them? Are they doing good? No. Nita, what happened? Until August, they are hammered in terms of stock price like crazy. They lost about 60-70% of their value. Just like a lot of tech companies, streaming companies lost value. Recently, Netflix is doing good. Just last week, they say that they actually have an increase in terms of subscribers. But where is the subscribers coming from? Well, Netflix started new campaigns. Now you can have Netflix with ads. Normal Netflix is $15.99. Netflix's ad is $6.99. $6.99. That's why new subscribers are coming. Okay? I just read their earnings announcements. Basically, they are just summarizing their performance in year 2022. They are just saying that from now on, the days that we are borrowing money, producing content is over. Okay? We are going to slow down. What else they are doing? They are cracking down on password sharing. They know that they are losing a lot of basically subscription because people are sharing their password. And if you're sharing the Netflix, Netflix password, they are coming after you. Point here is that in the first half of 22, they didn't do well. They are doing okay right now, but I got to say that it is mainly coming from this new ad and password sharing stuff. Point is, Netflix is running a very risky business model, okay, which reminds me of a Turkish song. It says, we got to fly to stay alive. These guys need to produce content to stay alive, okay? And the content is very risky. It has a short life. It is expensive. And, you know, there is a lot of content that you produce, which is 
nobody watches it, okay? Which is very risky, that's what I'm trying to say. So, that's the summary of what we are basically learning today in financial statements. Today we talked about financial accounting information. In particular, we discussed balance sheet, income statement, cash flow statement, but more importantly, my discussion was basically on from by looking at these financial statements, what do we learn about the companies that we are investing in? On the one hand, we have a boring company called, or in my opinion, boring, Walmart. They have boring assets, property, equipment, and inventory, which is financed freely. They don't pay interest. They don't make a lot of, they don't make a lot of margin, but they are a high turnover business. They are just selling quickly, generate a lot of value. On the other hand, there is a risky company that we have seen. The most important asset is content asset, which is a life of maximum four years, and then it is financed through debt for which you need to pay a lot of interest. It seems like the Netflix is profitable, but they don't have cash. If something happens, if one of these lenders say that from now on, I'm not gonna lend you any money, boom, music stops. For Walmart, if you say that I'm not lending you money, they don't care. They are not using a lot of um, bank lending or bonds anyway. But for uh, Netflix, if they cannot borrow money, music stops, okay? I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Are there any questions for me? Are we good? Yep, I think we're good. I think you All covered right. a lot. Um, oh. I just wanted to do a little wrap up here and thank you, Professor Khan. This was such a great session on using financial statements in a lot of business decision making. I appreciate all of your great insights today. I really hope everyone enjoyed this live class experience, which would be just very similar to one of the classes you could experience within ESA online programs. Um, thank you to everybody who shared um, questions and, and brought some great comments to the table. February 2nd is our next um, and final deadline to apply for the IMBA, IMSM uh, programs, as well as uh, some of our graduate certificates uh, for a spring start in March. IMSA applications are now open for a fall August start. Um, we're really happy to help you in, in whatever way we can here at Geese. I'd love to have a conversation with you. Um, but at this point, I hope everyone has a great morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Thanks again, Professor Akhtai. That was very My energetic. Pleasure. And um, everybody have a great rest of your day.